you won't know their story. I'm a graduate from Lincoln University, the oldest black college in the United States. Started by the Presbyterians. That's right. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're right. Because they wouldn't let a black man in Princeton. That's right. That's why they started Lincoln. Uh, Bill Cosby said that he never wanted to hear anybody that Howard was, I mean, Harvard was better than Lincoln because Harvard didn't have that good old Lincoln spirit. So one of the things that I got from going to a black college was that good old spirit and the encouragement. And that's what we need to share with our children. Oftentimes, many will go to white schools and they get lost in the sauce. Yeah, the, um, an additional teaching, teaching tool is, is an excellent book that came out last year, Ebony and Ivy by Wilder, that shows how all of our Ivy League schools were started by slaves, where masters took their slaves to school and they built Harvard, they built Yale, they built the University of Pennsylvania, they built Princeton. So that's a teaching tool. But in addition to that, how, how you're right. When I went to, when, now I'm, I'm from Philadelphia, from the East Coast, okay? When I got to Chicago, the kids there not only had not heard of Howard or Virginia Union or Virginia State or Lincoln or Morehouse or Spelman, they hadn't heard of those. The counselors in the schools were steering them away from those schools, all right? So I did for our congregation what I did with my five kids. And I said to my five kids, you got 117 colleges you can choose from. All of them black. <laughs> Daddy ain't writing no check to a white school for undergraduate school. Graduate school, fine. But in undergraduate school, you have a family sense. That, just like, where's, where's? Here he is, American Baptist College. Everybody there knew who he was, knows who he was, because the teachers care about you. And the teachers will put their foot in your behind if you start falling behind. You go to a major white university, you're a number. You're not a person. They're interested in Title I money, Title II money, Title IV money, Title whatever money. They're not interested in you, the individual. So pushing, uh, pushing HBCUs became very important. I, that's how I raised my five kids. One of them finished Clark Atlanta, Howard, Hampton, and our baby just finished Howard, cum laude, straight in. Um, but you're absolutely right that we have to do that. But again, so many of us raised in a climate like this don't know about those schools. You see Rose Bowl, how many Rose Bowl games you watched? You've seen what, Michigan State, UCLA, USC, Notre Dame. You ever seen Grambling? On, in the Rose Bowl <laughs> on national TV. And in fact, every time they have a black band on national TV, they flood the TV with commercials. You got to be at the game to see that band perform. How come that? Because of the media that controls the images. And like I said, when you were growing up media, we didn't have media like we have media today. But you're right. Is that Brother right. Stuber? Um, first off, I want to say that this is probably one of the first lectures that I have, my mind has never wandered while I was sitting here listening to you. And I want to thank you for that. But as a UCC pastor, which I am, and an alumnus of this institution, um, and also the president of the uh, ecumenical mainline church body here in Rochester, look around here and there's a number of white folks out here, and one of the questions that I'm sure many of them have come, it's as I have, is what message can you help me to bring back to my congregation to help them understand what you've explained to us tonight? The, um, from my, what now, for 42 years in our denomination, the, the white pastors who have done that successfully have been pastors who have done it in many different ways. Sometimes there have been meetings with members of your congregation and members of our congregation for a whole Bible study, 12 weeks, 24 weeks, where they get to know so many 
white members of the United Church of Christ, for instance, in, in the Illinois Conference, do not know another black member of a UCC. They see the guy does his shoes, they see the guy that parks the car, but they don't know this person as a human being they never talked to. And some of them were amazed to find out, that's a beautiful choir, look at them, they got all that African attached, wonderful. That's a psychologist, that's an oncologist, that's a lawyer, they didn't know that. They just know these people got good music. Well, meetings, Bible studies together, risking, risking, risking sermons that broach the subject and, to, uh, and having talk back feedback after the sermons is another way of doing that. Um, using, I just mentioned the cross and the lynching tree. I just mentioned L.H. Welchel, who wrote The History and Heritage of the African American Church, A Way Out of No Way or Gerard Wilmore's Black Religion and Black Radicals, using those books in your congregation for a study, showing what passages in the Bible different clergy were using at different points in history to justify slavery and to fight against slavery, opening in the eyes of the members who, who are not taught that in the schools that they attended in your congregation and in our congregation. Um, we, use, we use those kinds of books. Jacqueline Grant, Katie Cannon, uh, Renita Weems, who's coming to speak for graduation, Renita, using Renita's, using Renita's books for the women in your church, or and the women and men of your church, as you get ready for graduation, for them to see just a sister away, listening for God, all of those kinds of books that, that she has written, how important they are, to expose them to, a, this is a black Hebrew Bible scholar. My God, I didn't know they made them kind of people. <laughs> Uh, but but that, that also opens their eyes in terms of what's going on in other parts of the world that they normally do not frequent. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Wright. Um, thank you so much for um, everything that you said. The question that I have is um, being... ...of advice or encouragement, can you give us regarding the prophetic witness because one of the things that I found is that a lot of preachers, they will not speak truth to promise and they stand back when it comes to actually speaking prophetically in the utterance. So how can we um, not have that fear? And as women in the gospel, what can you say to us that will have us to, to break all the barriers and everything that is prohibiting us from going forward prophetically. The, um, if I'm hearing you correctly, there, there are two parts to your question. The first part is easy. The second part, break all the barriers, is the hard part. <laughs> uh, the first part is, uh, for, uh, under my watch, there were 42 seminary trained graduates I ordained. 32 were women. All right. Now, I, I lifted, well, I brought, I brought to them all across the years. I brought Renita Weems, I brought Gina Stewart, I brought Prathia Hall Wynn, I brought women, strong women, uh, Christian gospel preachers and pastors so they could be exposed to them. But I also lifted up my mother. I wanted them to know my mother, my mother's story. Now, my mother grew up in an age when they wouldn't call her a minister. She's a Women's Day speaker. <laughs> uh, but I lifted up my mother uh, as an example of addressing the primary questions. Who called you to ministry? Don't ever give up on that. Don't ever take your eyes off that. Don't lose your focus on what, what folk are saying, what the tr church and tr different traditions are saying. If you're called to the gospel ministry by God, that's who, to whom, the one to whom you're accountable. The folks that say women can't preach, they don't have a heaven or hell to put you in, don't back up because of them. Stay focused on who it is that called you to preach and do what it is that God uh, called you uh, to do. Now, in terms of those barriers, um, <laughs> That's a hard question. That's a very difficult question because the barriers, well, let me start with my, my own experience. I would say as a United Church of Christ pastor to my women seminarians, if you're called to pastoral ministry, get out of this denomination. 
go to United Methodist, go to United Presbyterian, go somewhere where you can get a pulpit with a real salary and benefits. Because if you got to depend on us, us calling you, it ain't going to happen. I mean, Prathia started her church, well, her was her daddy's church. Cynthia Hale had denominational help to start Ray of Hope. Now, Church of Christ is not going to give you no money to start no, no black UCC church like they, the Disciples of Christ did, Cynthia. So if your pastoral ministry is your passion, get out of a denomination where there are barriers and go into a denomination where there are none. Because I, no matter how many times I read that Bible, I cannot find a denomination there. Except for John the Baptist, he thinks. He, Um, one, one, I got to get share, and then we come into you, sister. One, 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 one of my mothers, one of my mothers, my mother helped me a lot. My mother helped me a lot. Uh, and one of my favorite instances, for instance, about my mother and, and the whole nature, every preacher in here will understand this. My second year at Trinity Church, I called home one Sunday afternoon. I needed desperately to speak to my father who pastored our church for 42 years in Philadelphia. When I called, he was at an afternoon service somewhere. My mother said, what's wrong with you? You sound terrible. I said, I need to speak with daddy. She said, what's wrong? I said, you, you wouldn't understand. What do you mean I wouldn't understand? I said, I need to speak to a preacher. <laughs> she said, oh, that's how it's gonna be? I said, no, 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 no. I mean, I mean somebody who preaches every Sunday, all right? And, and uh, she said, well, what? She said, I'm married to a preacher. I'm a daughter of a preacher. My brother is a preacher. What are you talking about? I said, Mommy, I flunked this morning. You know what flunk is? Now, anybody in the white church does not know what flunk is? Flunk is when the sermon just bombed. <laughs> I said, my father, your husband taught me if the Holy Ghost don't meet you in this study, don't look for him in the pulpit. <laughs> you hear a preacher talking about, help me, Holy Ghost. It's too late. He wanted to help you <laughs> in the study. <laughs> if the Holy Ghost don't meet you in the preparation, do not look for him in the proclamation. And every Saturday night, until, until Daddy we got too sick, we would call each other on Saturday night, and he'd start off, are you ghost up for tomorrow? Yeah, I'm all ghost. If the Holy Ghost is mentioned, then fine. I said, and the Holy Ghost, I mean, it was, it was, I was excited, and the thing just flopped. Bam. She said, you asked me, do I know what flunk is? I, I said, yeah. She said, do you remember when I told you about going to Charles Booth's church in Columbus? She said, flunk flew on the same plane with me, but he was in first class. When we got to the hotel, Flunk had the presidential suite, got up an hour ahead of me, got to church before me, stood at the pulpit and said, come here. <laughs> Flunk was all over me. Yeah, of course I know what Flunk is, but let me ask you this. Do you aspire to be a master at your craft of preaching? And be honest. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, that is a noble aspiration. Don't ever think you've made it and have arrived. Keep striving to be a master at your craft. But please remember this as you strive. Every piece by a master is not a masterpiece. <laughs> she, she said, you see the stuff that made it to the, to the art gallery in the museum. You don't see that stuff at home. She said, when you're a pastor, the folk at home see all the stuff that should have been left in the basement or in the attic, but they love you anyway. Um, but her example of a female in ministry who never stopped being who she was, nor what God called her to be, is what I would hold up for models for the, the women in ministry. And my, I mentioned this afternoon, oh, that was at lunch. I'm married to a minister. She's a graduate of Garrett Evangelical United Methodist Seminary. Uh, Howard Thurman, in your liberation theology. How do I what? How would you situate the theologian Howard Thurman? Howard Thurman? Uh -huh. I would situate it by going straight to his grandmama. Remember what his grandmama told him? His grandmother could not read. 
She was a part of the oral, oral culture by which we passed on theology from generation to generation, the same way the Torah was passed on, oral, oral, before it was ever written down. And Thurman, every time he would try to read to her from the epistles of Paul, would stop him. She said, that, that ain't, that's not inspired of God. Because <laughs> he's the one that says, slaves be obedient to, to your masters. Women be quiet in the church. That ain't God. His, his grandmother's theology, which inspired him, he was not somebody who marched with King. He's somebody King consulted with. But his grandmother, I trace mine straight through Howard back to, to the foundation that his grandmother laid for him. 